It is my pleasure to be the host this evening of the talk, not of the school, um, and it's my pleasure to introduce Anne Fitzgerald and Kath Smith, both colleagues of mine at Monash. Mm -hmm. And the format for the evening, so you've got some homework as you listen to the talk. The format of the evening is that they're going to give about 40 minutes of talk and plenty of time at the end for questions. So think about the questions as you go through because we'll have plenty of time for it. That whole point here is engaging in science ed conversations. So that's your homework. So without further ado, I'm going to listen to Anne and Kath talking about science education that matters. I would say it all matters. Enhancing learning and enriching teaching in the primary years. So thanks, Ange and Kat. Thanks, thanks Deb. Deb. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Here we thanks, are. Thanks, everybody. We're really excited to be here because we get to talk about something that we absolutely love, which is primary science education. Absolutely. And I'm feeling like um, with the people in the front row with pens and paper that I, I've got a bit of pressure, actually. I feel like I've got to say something important. But um, yeah, no, we definitely, this is something that we both have done a lot of thinking about. We talk about it a lot. We talk with other people and we do a lot of um, time in classrooms and with and teachers with teachers in primary schools and so this is really important to us so um, what we're covering tonight um, just to give you a sense is um, look I guess this is a response Kath and I have noticed that a lot of the dialogue around primary science education can be really negative a bit of a deficit and we we don't believe in that and we are about changing that conversation and this is a conversation and that's why that time at the end is really important so we can talk about these things so we're really about we want to acknowledge that primary school teachers as generalist teachers bring a lot of pedagogical strengths to what they do um, and we really value the voices of teachers so tonight it won't be so much about kath and i talking Phew. Um, but instead about uh, some video and, and you'll be listening to teachers talk about what matters to them. So that's quite important to us. Um, and so it's about sharing stories of quality learning and teaching in science. And I guess it's speaking back to some of the rhetoric, some of the politics that exist around science education in primary schools. So we're pretty excited because one of the things that I feel very privileged about in the work that I do is I get to work with the most amazingly talented teachers. Uh, and these primary teachers are the experts in this field of primary science education. We're certainly not the experts, they are. And I've learned a great deal about quality teaching and quality learning from these teachers. So tonight, as Ange said, we really want to uh, give them a voice because science education is out there in the public domain and there's a particular focus on primary science education, but what's missing from the debate is really the voice of the teachers themselves. Primary science education is really interesting because it looks really different to science education at any other level of education, particularly school education. And sometimes that can be misunderstood it doesn't always occur in a special room. It doesn't always occur at a special time. And as Ange said, sometimes there's assumptions that are made about that as if it needs to improve. It needs to be put in this box. It needs to have special time um, devoted to it. Now, the misunderstanding is that there's no science taking place. And what we want to share with you tonight are some stories that actually show how complex teaching science in a primary school setting is and how primary education by its very nature offers the potential for some really rich science education. So how do we give you a snapshot view of what teachers actually attend to when they're planning for science in a primary school setting? best way to do that is get the teachers to tell us themselves. So the first clip we're going to show you is a, you know, I filmed it, it's certainly not a Steven Spielberg <laughs> clip, but it was taken at a recent professional learning program, which I'm looking around and I know a lot of faces here actually know, which is the Contemporary Approaches to Primary Science Education program. And um, we took all of the teachers in that program down to St Joe's at Crib Point and we visited that school and we had a whole lot of teachers talking about their practice. 
you're going to hear Sue Jackson, who is the deputy principal of that school, explain the whole range of decisions that that school, particularly leadership, attends to when they're trying to promote science education and enhance the opportunities for quality learning in their school. And what I want you to notice in, uh, as Sue's speaking are the layers of complexity that these teachers are dealing with in their planning. So let's just take a look. Box of science for the week. Uh, we recognised that we weren't really, it, there was no deepening of science because it, they were seeing it once a week and often when you have a specialist in something, teachers can view that as I don't have to teach that now. So, you know, they have an hour of science a week so we didn't really need to cater for it in our classroom. After some discussion we came up with what we called big concepts or big ideas and we, we created a little bit of a scope and sequence of those and they are continually evolving so this is actually different these ones are a little bit different to the ones that we had a year ago and we sort of check in with those with uh, the whole school each year and to say is this actually catering to what we want. Look at what's the science in that concept. Um, and when, we, when they did start to look at the science it was very biological or chemical based. And the, the poor earth and space and physical science was <coughs> kind of left off and hopefully um, hopefully it would just sort of happen through osmosis. Uh, Recognising this, we did a bit of a survey of the students and audit of work programs, survey of the teachers, and the data was basically backing up what we were thinking, that the majority of the science at St Joe's was chemical and biological based. Amazing, because they were tapping in, they had started to tap into gardens and different things, but there was a half of the curriculum that we weren't actually really catering for well. A template to say, okay, if our theme is identity and diversity, what are the um, things in the different areas of the curriculum that can sort of connect to that uh, particular concept. And again, um, this was a bit of a journey over time, can I just say. So we've all we've continually been tweaking it and evolving, going, this didn't work, we need to now look at this and deepen it a little bit more. So this is where we started, we were using this and we were going, okay, identity and diversity, what are some, and looking at the curriculum and sort of starting there. When we were doing that, we were noticing that, again, it wasn't very natural, it wasn't always deepening, and sometimes you can force connections, which means that the curriculum, it doesn't work. I think as teachers, if we're forcing those connections, then the kids will struggle to understand the concepts. <coughs> so then, last year, we were lucky enough to go to Emerging Pedagogical Leaders Program. <laughs> and particularly with science, the missing part was the discussion before we even looked at the curriculum. We didn't know what teachers knew about that particular science area. And when we started to have those discussions, we recognised that physical science isn't being taught because we don't have a strong, we're not physicists, <laughs> we don't have a strong understanding and sometimes there's that habit if it's a little bit scary, particularly with science, because it can get very technical very quickly. There's that habit to kind of move away from it a little bit and go, I'll just do push and pull and hopefully that just covers what I'm supposed to cover, but not actually understanding the scientific concept behind it. So when we were part of the program, they talked about these um, different foci that helped you to have a discussion. So we, we looked at planning in a different way. When we came to planning for our inquiry, particularly in change, with the change theme, we, looked, we had these headings and we had a discussion around these headings. So we wanted to know what teachers thought the big idea was and we unpacked it and thought, well, what, what does that mean? And as we were having those discussions, we were writing down the science or we were writing down the history as we were just having those natural conversations. And it wasn't based around the curriculum at all. It was based around what we already knew or what we kind of knew but weren't sure whether we knew or not. <laughs> um, then we talked about how, you know, routes to engagement, how we can um, link into these in particular in our context, in our local context, in our global context. And we had a really good discussion around the concept and pulled out the science from that discussion and what that, those scientific concepts possibly could be and how we could deepen them. So, um, by doing this, we ended up having a shared understanding among all teachers, I guess, of what the concept was across the school, but then I guess what the concept was at year levels and levels. 
uh, we were able to connect to engaging learning and our learning, our science and our learning was becoming more purposeful. So it wasn't just, it says push and pull in the curriculum, let's just do a quick push and pull activity and tick that box. It was, we wanted to deepen it. We wanted them to become scientists and really, you know, question, look at different things and how does this work and why does this work this way. Um, and it gave us an opportunity to build teachers' knowledge. So, the teacher's voice. Sue, talking about their practice. A really complex explanation about a whole lot of things. It wasn't just about one science concept. It was science learning that was situated within making links across all areas of the curriculum. Thinking about the child at the centre of the learning. Trying to make sure that it was purposeful and it was meaningful. Some of the things that the school actually attended to was trying to build teacher confidence. That's a really big issue in primary science education. But it wasn't from a deficit model. It wasn't saying you're not doing a good job. It was acknowledging all the wonderful things that primary teachers bring to teaching science and how can we help them to actually enhance what they're doing and make it even better. How can we help them get into those spaces of the curriculum that they're really nervous about? How can we do it in a way that's really contextually meaningful for the students here at our school? Now this school is amazing because when they were at CAPS the teachers sat around one night and they were trying to identify what makes our school special and they found that their school is located right on the coast and they're right near large mangroves that were depleting in population and they went away and they have they have developed this amazing mangroves rejuvenation project. And when we visited the school this year, the students took all the visiting teachers around and they could explain every part of the process, how they were growing the seedlings, when they were going to plant them, why they planted them at that particular time, what the conditions were, what the salt water did to the particular seedlings. They were amazing. They were like little walking encyclopedias. The adults could not have done it better. So this isn't, an, this isn't an initiative that the teachers themselves stand there and pat themselves on the back with. The students are proud of this work and they share it. And this has become something that really defines the work of this school. So keeping, keeping that passion and energy in your minds, keeping those words, keeping the complexity of the planning that Sue was talking about, Let's position it next to this. So this being a snippet from a document that was released last year by the Office of the Chief Scientist. Now, you, you know, you don't have to engage with all those words exactly, but we read this and we think about people like Sue and, and the school and what they're doing in science. And this starts to look, I don't know, bizarre, weird, and when we question this, and this is why we're interested in changing the conversation. To, so to pick a few things out here, the Office of the Chief Scientist thinks that, and this is, is positioned around STEM. So we all know STEM's a pretty hot topic, and this is, you know, what we're focused on. But we were interested, the Office of the Chief Scientist is interested in raising the prestige and preparedness of teachers to teach in STEM. So let's do that by increasing, um, high achievers into primary schools, into primary school education. Let's do that by boosting and improving um, pre-service teacher courses. Let's do it by transforming education. Let's bring in specialist teachers. Yeah, let's um, do a national professional development program. Let's educate principals to be leaders in STEM. Hmm, it's really interesting to think about these points after listening to Sue and after thinking about science education in those ways. It's the third point that we really grab onto and this is the point that we think is really heartening and we wonder who did the Office of the Chief Scientist and the people that wrote this report talk to? What stories did they get? Because we think what we're going to be sharing with you um, now is this. It's teachers thinking boldly, they're collaborating, they're working together and they're leading change in science education. We think this is happening already and we want, to, we want to document and share this with you now. And I guess a really important point to make is no one would argue that primary science does not need further support. It needs more financial support. It needs great professional learning opportunities for teachers. 
But somewhere in this story, the teacher's voice is missing. Somewhere in this story, not every school is right at the beginning of this story. And if you think about primary science education on a continuum, some schools are right at the beginning. Some schools are really nervous about teaching science. But for quite a long time, and certainly in my career, I've been working with schools and watched them move along that continuum. And many schools are really leading the pack in some of the innovations and approaches that they've developed for science education. So we also want to put that voice in this discussion. This is in the public domain. It's not always that things are lacking. But more importantly, if we say good things are happening, if we say that there are primary teachers and schools out there doing innovative things, we've got some key questions to ask. What can we learn from the stories of the teachers who are already thinking boldly, who are already collaborating and who are already leading change in this area? What can we learn from what they're doing? What matters for these teachers? And as they work to provide rich opportunities for science learning, what do they pay attention to? And also, how can their experiences and their professional knowledge actually inform meaningful change? So somewhere, as you'll find, a lot of these teachers started in a space where they were really nervous. But what got them to the space they are now, where they're willing to take risks and they're willing to, to really try different things? These are not schools where they had specialist science teachers. In fact, if you heard Sue in that clip that we played right at the start, she said it was in a box and the teachers would say, I've done half, it's, it's had its half an hour now, we won't touch science again. And that's always the challenge when it's taken out of the classroom teacher's hands. There's great arguments for co-teaching, fantastic arguments for co-teaching. But putting it in a specialist box makes it look really different or makes it look similar to the way we see it in other areas of education. But what is it about primary education, the nature of the experience at primary education that makes it so special? Why does it look different? What are those teachers aiming for? And so really what we did, we wanted to get those stories. And so we reached out to um, four teachers over three schools and we simply put four questions to them, these four questions. One was around the purpose. What do they see as the purpose of science education in a primary school? Okay, well, what's, what is quality science learning? What does that look like to you? What does quality science teaching look like to you? And importantly for the context, as a generalist teacher, and this is, the, this is what Kath's just capturing there, you know, they started off nervous and they and progressed and embraced science. What was it that helped them to develop their capacity and their passion, their skills in science learning and teaching? So that were the four questions we put forward. So let's introduce our teachers. And one of them is here tonight. Mary is our star. <laughs> so we have four amazing teachers, and there were a lot of teachers that we could have asked, but these teachers were incredibly generous with their time. This is what we find with primary teachers all the time. I sent out an email, yes, no problem. They're always there and interested in actually promoting what they do because they are rarely asked to promote what they do. So we have Mary, and Mary at the moment is teaching part-time. Mary will tell you in the clip how long she's been teaching. We'll save that for Mary to say. <laughs> at the moment, she's in a role where she's a science support person, so she's actually not working as a science specialist, but she's certainly in all of the planning and helping each grade level with their work. The school that Mary works at is an inner city school. That just gives you a little bit of a background. We also have Nicole. Nicole is a full-time classroom teacher. She is, uh, has a passion for science, as you will find out. Her school is located 104 kilometres from Melbourne. That gives you a little bit of a background. Also down on the coast. 
Uh, and we have Suzanne and Gab. Now Suzanne is a part-time teacher in the school and Gab is the principal at their school. And so their school is located 68 kilometres from Melbourne. So what we did was we asked each of these teachers, we sent them out an email and said, could you talk about these particular questions? And they sent their clips back to us. So what we'd like to do tonight is allow them to tell you their story about what matters to them. But we're hoping that by doing this, you'll start to build a bit of a profile about what matters to primary teachers and why science looks different in primary schools. So, so we're gonna go question by question and allow these teachers to respond and uh, we'll pick out some things. And I think, you know, part of the questions you might be, or discussion you might want to have at the end might be based on some of the things you're noticing from what's So said. we have a wall of faces that we're going to play yeah. for you. So the first question was, what's the purpose? What's the purpose? If children aren't turned on to investigating their own questions about the world and everything in it in primary school, then chances are they'll learn quickly to stop even asking the questions and their motivation for for pursuing those interests later in secondary school and beyond will dry up. Australia, the world, needs people who can observe natural and man-made problems or phenomenon and ask challenging questions and pose reasonable scientific solutions to those problems. In earlier times, humans behaved as if their role on this planet was to continually question and solve its mysteries. This gave rise to religions, philosophy and all sciences. Unfortunately, now these ways of thinking and seeing seem to have been institutionalised to the point that if someone, the teacher, doesn't plan time for children to engage in these disciplines within a formal curriculum, then they just don't get their time. They certainly don't appear to be the topics of conversation around family dinner tables, and even adults tend to rely on the ABC's Q&A to inspire them to this kind of thinking. I think science is um, it's a good vehicle for children to be making meaning of the world and discovering the world um, based on scientific um, principles and understandings. What do you think? I, th I think it's the same about um, inquiring and making meaning from these inquiries and maybe um, it's also about developing plans and procedures for the future, so for a more sustainable environment or um, you know, for like um, science is a human endeavour, so that's where I see the purpose of science education. If they need, um, they need experiences where they can make that meaning and understanding of scientific concepts so that that guides their understanding and then they're given opportunities to inquire and discover within that, yep. um, within their context too, so that they can relate the, the scientific concepts to their world. Next year I will have been teaching for 50 years uh, and while I always thought science was important, never is it as important as it is now in the changing world, particularly for primary school students. Why? Primary school students are at the most curious at this age. They are the least likely to accept the opinions and answers of others and they seem to be constantly asking me, but why does it happen like this? Here's an opportunity for teachers to capitalise on something that excites students. The very word science makes students' eyes light up with expectation. It's our role as primary school teachers to create an awareness of science, help students find science in their world, and developing thinking students, developing students who can reason, developing students who can articulate what they, um, what they learn, uh, enabling students the opportunity to create uh, and will only help them build on their knowledge as they grow older. They may not uh, become science students in secondary school and universities, they may not even have science careers, but we are developing young people who will be informed, involved citizens and will take action in whatever walk of life they have to promote um, and improve the environment in which we live. Thanks Mary. 
<laughs> so I guess um, for me, a number of points come out. And I think the one that Mary raises at the end there is really important to me. I think the idea that we're not necessarily preparing students in our primary schools to be scientists. You know, it's about preparing them to be scientific citizens or scientifically literate citizens, informed citizens, citizens who can question, as, as Nick mentioned, you know, the power of questioning, that inquiring mind, that critical mind, that sceptical mind. So that, I think that's a really important point. Um, I think another thing that I really want to pick up on, I won't go through all of these points because I'm conscious that we want to get through this and we also want to leave some of it open for your discussion, is that real sense and awe of, that sense of awe and wonder that science brings. And I think we should be tapping into that. And so I think the purpose of science was coming through in those, in those snippets there that um, that's a real opportunity. As a, and science is a vehicle, and we often talk about this, science is a great vehicle for many different aspects of, of learning, many different skills and, and a lot of different content and ideas. So let's move on to the next uh, question that we posed to our teachers. Quality science learning might look different in different locations and amongst different groups of learners. In a primary school classroom, it generally begins with a concept or a big idea or a big question. And if the teacher facilitating learning has what I call a vast pedagogical toolbox, then the learning can take many paths for different children. Quality science learning typically sees students highly engaged in investigating, experimenting or researching things that are of substantial relevance to them. Students might work on their own, but generally their learning is enhanced by bouncing ideas off other children, either in partnerships, small groups or just in sharing groups where they get to talk about their individual findings. So quality science learning might be noisy. It also engages all the senses and creates opportunities for students to use their strengths while developing their less strong learning skills. For example, I love science drama. There are some children who get a huge kick out of dramatising their ideas who ordinarily might not enjoy the more odious task of written research. Quality science learning matters. It matters to the students who believe that the outcomes of their learning will indeed benefit others or contribute to our shared knowledge. Therefore, there needs to be opportunities in the learning process for students to communicate their findings to wider audiences or act on their learning in more public ways. For example, students at my school learning about the limestone foundations of our school in an earth science unit wanted to share this publicly to let people know how rising waters and climate change might affect these foundations in the future. So I think quality science learning um, should be based on an inquiry approach with a basic set of skills and capabilities that you're trying to build in your children through a discovery or inquiry approach um, and that there's a lot of, I suppose, questioning and making meaning and conversations and dialogue and real hands-on experience out in the world so they can actually experience the science in the world. Just taking action. Yeah, taking, taking action, action in their communities yeah. or... Um, Looking at their context, seeing what yeah. they see, Comparing you know, is there context, biological so science they can tap into in their community? Is there um, their authentic and purposeful experiences that can bring out the science in their own world so that they really make meaning of it? Yeah, and I just think it's important too to, I guess, touch on those dispositions um, because science knowledge is ever-changing. So um, we don't want them just to learn from a textbook. We want them to actually um, be able to be researchers and um, creators. So being a scientist. And being a scientist. And what that actually you know, looks like. And it yeah. doesn't look like they're walking around in the lab, lab coats and, um, you know, using bunts and burners. It means that, in to me, in everyday life, they need to be able to see the science. Yeah on a daily basis and to do that they have to have really good I suppose facilitators around them to activate that understanding and to scaffold that learning so that they get the scientific understandings and then be able to relate it to their life because they're not probably going to get them all through osmosis and through no. just um, just um, being active yeah. in the world. They need that guidance to get that really deeper understanding of what that looks like. Without quality teaching you rarely get quality learning. Uh, we're talking about learning, it has to be uh, something that is at the child's level, something a child can understand, 
something that a child is able to articulate and encouraged to articulate to both people who are older and students who are younger. Uh, I think uh, quality learning sticks with children forever. A recent example, an ex-parent came to the school to speak to the grade six children, a family company that grows algae uh, that is capable of cleaning and clearing water. The students were uh, able to make the connection to the uh, pollution in the Arrow River, which in most, often in their cases is less than five or six kilometres from their homes, so of interest to them. They uh, inquired in, in, with the use of the internet, um, um, guest speakers and numerous other in techniques to um, add to the skills they had. Eventually, we were asked, or the school was asked, if the class would like to attend uh, a function at the Arrow River, uh, run by uh, the politician, Mr Freiburg, and it was to introduce uh, a new litter trap that was set up there. It was part of the Keep Australia Beautiful Week, so the students uh, went along. It was unbelievable the amount of knowledge they had um, on the cleaning of the water, the necessity for water sanitation, uh, and again they were able to contribute to the knowledge of other people who were actually at the function. Students are able to articulate what they learn, and that's probably one of the better ways of uh, discovering what children have actually learnt and the quality of the learning they've had. Today I went to a foundation class and I was asked to introduce the water cycle. At least six hands went up and looks on their faces. We know all about it, they said. We know all about the water cycle. So I said, well, could you tell me about it? And in their own words, and probably not the words a scientist would use, they knew exactly how uh, the water cycle worked. The learning for them was at their level and it was accurate. What's really interesting about listening to teachers as they're working, uh, as they're talking about their practice, is their professional knowledge about what they're looking for, the indicators of understanding. The sort of wonderful experiences that they provide for their students. A few years ago, uh, I worked with teachers, and Mary was one of them, and Anne was one of them too, who's here tonight, and we were looking at developing scientific literacy. And a big outcome of the book that we worked on were teachers saying to me, we don't want our students just to do science. Mm -hmm. We want them to be science. We want them to think science. We want them to act science. We want science to be the way that they build a connectedness to their world so that they understand the decisions they make actually have an impact somewhere along the line or that they matter. So there's this bigger picture around primary science education. You rarely hear a teacher talking about, or these teachers talking about one activity. They're talking about the learner that they're developing. And in fact, at St Joseph's, there's a whole list of dispositions that the school is trying to develop in the learners right through their primary science education. And science is one of those vehicles through which they can do that. So there's a number of things that came out in, this, in the comments about quality learning, this importance of making meaning, the big strong links between language and communication, that oral language development, literacy, getting kids to talk, to write, to share their ideas in lots of different ways. I loved Mary's comment, and unfortunately I had to cut out some of the stories there, but it stays with the child forever. How many times teachers come to me and they meet a child somewhere who says to them, I remember when we did mm -hmm. you know, this years ago. This is what primary teachers are aiming for. Not just that they tick the box on doing an electricity activity, but that somewhere along the line, the experience is going to ignite something in their students. And that's what they're trying to develop. So it takes us on to the third question, and what's quality teaching look like in primary science? Well, essentially what you want to do is to inspire students to seek the amazing in what they might see as ordinary. 
because the accessibility of digital images, TV and film seem to have made mundane so many aspects of our world that teachers of science sometimes have to help students find the wow factor in things that may not usually appear so wow. Being able to do this means the quality science teacher really has to have nurtured and maintained a personal childlike sense of wonder and awe. Often this means you'll seek out personal opportunities to develop your own knowledge or to just enjoy the wow moments yourself, be it bushwalking, gardening, fishing, snorkeling, tinkering in the shed or buying a new robot, which I did on the weekend and it is truly wow. And in doing these things, you're always thinking, where is the learning opportunity in this? It may not equate to the science curriculum, but that doesn't matter. Often quality science teaching challenges the confines of regular classrooms and school structures. It might involve building an ant farm in an old sand pit and sourcing a huge piece of perspex to cover it. Or it may be having to discourage the enthusiastic bug collectors in the, in the schoolyard from collecting the redbacks after you've inspired them to find all the bugs in the yard. And so for me, I think it's um, teachers having a real clear idea of, um, of what uh, they want the students to learn or achieve or create or be or it's the intention of, of the learning and, and what they want the students to get out of it and that they um, are strategic and put out those uh, have that opportunity for students to ask questions and discover for themselves mm. but that um, the good quality science teaching is the teachers having I guess a clear understanding and making sure that they put the parameters in so that students um, I guess have the opportunity to discover and wonder for themselves. Mm. Well they it's almost that thinking has got to happen first so mm. they've got to have a bit of an understanding themselves of what they're actually going to guide these children to learn but also they've got to really make sure they're building explicit teaching of skills yep. so that the kids have those um, capabilities then to be good inquirers yep. and that doesn't just happen it's not like free range um, chickens running around it's guided teaching really that's through an inquiry lens so that the kids are really um, building those capabilities and being guided into what they know the possibilities are, but having a lot of voice and choice in that, so the kids are owning their learning as they go through. Now you are asking difficult questions. What is quality science teaching? Wow. Well, I think to begin with, you need quality teachers. Um, let's see. A lot of quality teachers around, but a quality teacher um, is certainly one that creates an environment that is safe for students to research safe for students to challenge each other um, and safe for them to feel comfortable asking the questions no matter how simple or how difficult uh, they may appear to be. Um, encouraging children to research and ask questions about scientific issues that they are interested in themselves. The other thing I think that we sometimes forget uh, as an enormous part of quality teaching is the teaching of skills. Um, uh, I find that um, for students who are able to go and predict what they think is going to happen, observe accurately or in detail, and then be able to tell you what they thought, whether it be right or be wrong, and how they would change their predictions next time. So. Collecting data, uh, sorting and categorising data, I think, is important. Uh, knowing what data to collect that will give results that are scientifically um, attached to the questions they might ask. Great, thanks, Kath. So, um we're getting carried away with these stories. They're so engaging and we're already conscious that time's slipping away. But there was a um, something that we cut out of there. Suze was speaking and she said, you might look into a, a, science, a science lesson in a primary classroom and it all looks like everything's pretty smooth. The teacher might be standing back. I think the idea of guide facilitator is a word that comes to mind um, when we think about quality teaching in science and uh, the kids will be engaging there'll be lots of opportunities and experiences in that classroom but she described it as the duck on the water everything looks calm but underneath you've done heaps of work and you're paddling really fast so I think that sometimes we underestimate 
the amount of work that goes into providing the opportunities, doing the thinking, doing the background work to prepare yourself and build your own knowledge. And so I think the messages in these aspects of these stories around quality teaching is that, yes, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of thinking, but you know, it's about providing opportunities for the students to engage and for you to step back and step in when required. When the teachers were asked to uh, identify as generalist teachers how they had developed their interest in science, there was a whole range of issues that were raised. A lot of people said that they had worked hard to build relationships with people who had expertise. People in their local community, uh, organisations that they would call in. Uh, they also felt that um, they'd taken the opportunity to teach in different schools, in different settings, uh, and that also they were willing to learn from the community. Nicole talked about teaching um, up in the Kimberleys and how she learned more from the Indigenous people that she taught in those eight years than she has learnt in any textbook or any, any documentary she's watched about science. So they valued all of those everyday experiences. Other teachers, of course, talked about professional learning programs that they had been a part of. And they also talked about facing your fears and really just having a go, getting in the space and realising you actually aren't going to do a lot of damage. In fact, if you can ignite students' interests and passion, you're sort of halfway there. So these things were the things that mattered to teachers. So in changing the conversation, I suppose the message that we really want to convey tonight, that we want the teachers to have a voice in these discussions about primary science education, because after all, this is really their space, this is really their domain. And there's a lot of people outside of primary teaching making a lot of noise about what they should be doing, but you could see from all of the clips that we showed you tonight that all of these teachers are thinking uh, thinking in a lot of detail about what they're doing and why they're doing it. Their pedagogical purpose is very, very clear. So we think that primary teachers actually need to be given permission to draw on their existing pedagogical strengths, to shape science education in ways that actually align with their views about quality learning and teaching. We also think that the expertise of generalist teachers should be acknowledged. For too long, we feel like primary teachers are getting beaten around the head all the time for what they're not doing. And yet, they bring so many skills to science. I remember when I worked at the Science Centre, just a little snippet here, we used to send scientists out to schools and I had this amazing astrophysicist from Monash University and he was going out to work with a prep class and he came back and he walked in my office this day and he looked a wreck. He absolutely looked a wreck and he said to me, Kath, I have lectured around the world. I have delivered, you know, um, keynotes. He said, that was the toughest audience I have ever had. Please don't send me out to preps again. <laughs> and I, it really made me laugh because he said I couldn't answer their questions. And I felt fantastic that day because I thought, if an astrophysicist can't answer their questions, then, you know, let's take that weight off our shoulders that science isn't about being the giver of all knowledge. It's about opening opportunities to learn. And uh, also, we think that primary teachers themselves need to be encouraged to value their expertise because they have a lot of wonderful professional knowledge. And really, working together with some of these strategies, we can really make fantastic opportunities available. It's not one or the other. It's actually mar marrying the pedagogy with the science in ways that make sure that our children actually have a fantastic primary education experience. So, yeah. that's it. That's it. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Kath and Thanks, Ange. Thanks, Deb. So, a few thank yous up there, but question time. So, I hope you've been doing your homework. <laughs> so, 
What questions would you like to ask of Ange and Kath to start the conversation? Did people get a sense that they agreed with most of those points that teachers raised or was there anything in there something that missing or felt maybe uncomfortable or that you weren't yeah. really sure about? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely, but yeah. Whole willingness to let go and learn with the kids and, and share, the, share the love of the learning. Yeah. Um, I think that's. And kids are so forgiving. Yeah. You know, if you stuff it up, they, you know, they can see that they're, they're, you're human like them, and that's, that's part of the learning. Yes, yes that's and Mary talks about that quite a lot, don't you Mary? You've written about that, the fact that you don't have to have all of the answers. Did you want to make a comment about that, Mary? About yeah. this notion that teachers sometimes go into teaching thinking, I've got to be the expert about all of this. You have to speak up though. I think that's a really important issue around quality learning is the social construction of knowledge. And primary teachers are very good at that. You know, uh, here's our definition that we're going to start with, but we're going to keep coming back to this. And you do this all the time. We're going to keep coming back to it. What do we think now? Let's change that. Let's build on that. What are the questions that we want to ask of that definition now? And one of the things that strikes me as really powerful about primary teachers is this notion of inquiry where teachers say, well, you know, okay, yes, we generate the questions at the start of the unit, but actually we keep generating the questions all the way along through the unit. The unit isn't about just answering those initial questions. A good inquiry unit generates more questions and more questions as we go, and maybe we'll never answer them all. But maybe the kids will go home and they're really fired up and they want to know. And that's a big tick. You know, I've achieved a lot. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really interesting. Uh, I know working with the pre-service teachers, I was thinking in my group this morning, they were making water filters. And they kept looking at me to say, <laughs> is this the way to do it? You know, and I'd say, how's it going? You know, is it working? Is the water clear? No? Huh. What would you change? Yeah, you. You know, and after a while they give up because they know you're not <laughs> going to tell them. You know? And yet that's what they're used to. They're used to a teacher who will stand and deliver information. And primary teachers don't do that because sometimes they're not all that confident with it themselves, but they value the exploration and they value students actually constructing their ideas and communicating how they're making links. So I think that's a really powerful part of primary teaching. Yeah. I'm curious to, to, to sort of ask a bit more about that because... Speak up, Al, because we've got it. Uh, I'm finding a notion with, within the, um, the, the teaching staff here about things have to be perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like it's more than... It's, it's part of it's a knowledge base. The notion of, of you've got to have the perfect um, class, you've got to have the perfect um, understanding before you go into something, rather than, and I think Mary was talking about the messiness of, of, yeah. of, of things, 
Could you talk to us about about what what that what your experiences are? That's really interesting yeah. because when you look at a resource like Primary Connections that's been developed that's a right. lot with teachers, their big message in every part of science teaching is you explore before explain. You've got to let the kids get into that whole messy area and be very comfortable with uncertainty. Now, the reason why teachers don't let them get into that uncertainty is because they're not comfortable with the, the uncertainty. And what we often observe is that primary teachers' pedagogy often shifts when they get to primary teach, sorry, science teaching. They're really great at working in other areas sometimes, they make all the links, but if they're really nervous about science, they go back to a very sometimes teacher-driven uh, activity, sometimes. And then that starts to change. When they realise they can let that go and they've got that permission that we were talking about before, they actually get in there and they let the kids explore and they start to explore with the kids as well. That's a really interesting point. Though. Yeah, and I think it goes back to that, um, what Kaz was talking about with the social construction of knowledge. I think if we don't have that opportunity to grapple and get frustrated like the students were this morning about the water filters, if we just give answers or we just go and Google that, you know, it's not going to be that same learning experience. It's not going to stick with you. It's not going to have meaning. Um, and it's, yeah, I guess there was that point earlier that it sticks with you for life and you, it's a skill that you need to develop. So I think to get rid of that messiness, to make it look perfect is a real disservice to the process of learning. And I, I think it, in my mind, it comes back to the idea of the journey not the end point, not the destination. So, and I think, you know, what I often think about in primary science education is actually they might not get to the end point. They might actually not get the full story at this point because, you know, in year one, year two, year six, and that's okay because there's many more years and many more things to grapple with and make sense of. So mm. I think, yeah, let's be messy, let's not be perfect. The, the truth of it is, Al, it takes time yeah, for teachers right. to get to that space. And, and that um, sit, in sit fact, up. Um, had some discussions with teachers this week where we sat for a long time and talked about a teacher saying, I'm not happy mm. unless the product is finished. Yep. And we had this really fantastic conversation about, is it the product or is it the process? Yeah. And do yeah. we always have to finish the product? Does it always have to be a project that's hanging yeah. on the wall, you know? Or is it about all of that language and talk? And so even in great schools where they're playing around in this space, you know, that baggage comes back and teachers think, but someone might walk into yeah. my classroom and it looks a mess because it's not all neat and tidy. So a big part of that, I think, is leadership in schools saying it's actually okay. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, we, we value uh, all of that learning, not just what's up on the walls or around the place, but it does take time and yeah. teachers sort of just at their own pace will let that go and everybody moves at a different pace with that. That's my experience. Yeah, and I think there's a baggage of accountability. So if I don't, my students haven't got those end products, what am I showing? You know, what's that assessment? How am I assessing that? People get nervous about that. So. We need to think, consider other ways of capturing exactly. that learning. Exactly, exactly. exactly. And I think schools are getting good at playing around with that space. But you know, teachers still tell me the stories where the parents do the project and the parents yeah. bring the project in and the parents are proud of the project. So it's also changing parental views around what is learning and what matters in learning. And for them to be comfortable in that space where, you know, something's not quite finished or doesn't look the shiny pin, you know, that's a really interesting point. Yeah. I think but that notion of teacher mindset is really important. And you're saying that um, teachers believing that if something has to be finished or it has to be perfect. It's sort of something that you, you can't just tell a teacher, no, this is how you ought to think as a teacher of science. They need to live the experience. And yeah. And I think um, allowing teachers to go into other teachers' classrooms to see how things function, see how discussions take place, and, and for them to sort of suddenly sort of breathe in the air of what it should be like really helps. Yeah. Because just to tell them, they just don't get it. Yeah. No, or they no, think that's they're right. doing it, but they're not. not. Yeah. So yeah. you sort of have to sit with it for sometimes years before yeah. suddenly you think, oh, I get it now. Yeah. yeah. And I think too, and that's a really uh, important point, because you do have to live it. You have to live the students learning and see the quality of the learning yeah. to then stand back and say, wow, I've never seen that before. I'm actually seeing my kids do something 
I've never seen them do before. Yeah. Yeah. And that's when you start to value that the messiness actually yeah. contributes. Yeah, you live it and yeah. then you really start to believe yeah. it. Yeah, and that's, that's right. Change and then you make me think back to the continuum that Kath referred to earlier. I think, you know, you move along and you, you do have to go and see other people. And I think going back to the whole point of tonight was to share the stories. You know, we have to talk and we have to share and yeah. have yes. to put these things out there. So I think, you know, Kath's got some examples there. Too, that you know one of the things that we do a lot in our professional learning is we actually try to encourage primary teachers to tell their story so I know Anna and Mary were involved in the development of this book scientific literacy under the microscope which was where a whole uh, group of teachers from the one school wrote about their learning um, and through the STEL program the science teaching and learning program you know teachers write cases about their experiences. And in the CAPS program, the Contemporary Approaches to Primary Science program, they make digital stories about their learning. And so all of this matters because it's a way of actually sharing um, their professional expertise. So Kat, on that, that's acknowledging teachers as professionals, yeah. but I'm also talking to teachers who are going, well, I don't understand electricity at the grade four level. And you know, I've got a challenge around that because realistically, as professionals, we've got the AXL standards in BIT that says, I understand the knowledge, I know the content that I have to teach. And I don't think it's unrealistic to expect all my primary teachers to actually understand science concepts up to grade six level. Do you think that that's unreasonable? No, but I think that primary, in my experience from doing this for a few years now, <laughs> um, I think primary teachers have a lot of knowledge. I think they know more than they that. That's, they that's know. exactly but right. Yeah. And when, when uh, planning becomes about, as Sue said, sitting around and talking about what do we know about this concept rather than here's the template, let's fill it out with activities, People start to build on each other's ideas and teachers develop questions that they want to find the answers to and that becomes a professional learning experience in itself. And I'm often surprised, we're often surprised in the work that we do, how much knowledge teachers bring to it. Actually, accessing knowledge isn't the issue. Yeah, you know, you can get that information anywhere. That's right, but what's really challenging is that you need the skills to determine the reliability and validity of the information that you access, and our kids need that too. So um, I think that's where um, primary teachers uh, are the most amazing teachers we work with because they, they go out and they get experts to come in to talk to the students. They draw in that expertise. They don't sit there comatose thinking, I can't do it. They're actually very proactive in going and building relationships. And uh, I'm always amazed by the amazing uh, partnerships that schools create and how they take advantage, you know, um, Gemma, of the sorts of programs that, you know, you're offering and taking out to schools and building their learning around those sorts of experiences. So um, I don't think it's unreasonable in answer to your question, Shell, but I think it's about these are people who often never got the message that they were any good at science at school. That's what I was thinking. There's a bit of baggage there, Shell, isn't there, about what it, an expectation of what it looks like to know science and how I'm meant to know it. But so. it's also about how they know it. So yeah. you, often it's presented to them as knowing the textbook yeah. stuff. Yes. I would, I, I would think it's really important that they actually know it in useful terms. Yeah. Okay, and having the confidence to say that is legitimate knowledge. It doesn't have to be of the textbook type at all. And primary teachers have that, and I'd contend that secondary teachers have lost that. <laughs> we could go on for ages. Yes, I we think could. This is a really um, yes, thanks. exciting topic. I wouldn't disagree with anything that you've said in a secondary context either, I've got yeah. to say. So um, can I just take the opportunity, firstly, to thank Alan, the principal of Holy Child Primary School, for hosting us this evening. So thanks very much. And thank you all for coming, but also to thank Ange and Cathy for some very entertaining stories of primary science learning. So thank you very much. Thanks, Deb. Thank you. And thanks to, yeah, thanks yes. to you guys for coming out and contributing to that conversation and sharing your stories. Yeah.